Well, good evening, friends, and welcome once again to another night of Revelation Today, The Great Reset. We're so glad that you're here. Those that are live with us here in Chattanooga and those that are watching around the world, we're so glad that you've joined us for this dynamic Bible study. We've studied a number of exciting topics. We have a lot more to come, including the Mark of the Beast, the United States and Prophecy, and more. Friends, you're not going to want to miss a single night. So those of you watching, we are welcoming you here in Chattanooga. We're so glad you joined us. And just last night, we had a number of people watching from all over the world. Here's some of the places folks were watching from. Vancouver, Washington, Toronto, Canada, Nova Scotia, Canada, Trinidad and Tobago, Great Britain or the United Kingdom, Florida, Kentucky, and almost all of the 50 United States. So those of you watching, thank you so much for joining us. Just to remind you, On the website, you'll find all kinds of resources. You'll find the study guides that you need for each night's topic, as well as the free PDFs that will take you deeper into the study for that night's topic. You're able to download those online, and we hope that you do so. Just a reminder to share the website with your friends. You may be being blessed, but don't keep it to yourself. Share that with others. Put it on social media. Put it on your Instagram and Facebook and whatever you have, and let the world know that these meetings are happening literally all around the world. So just to remind you, we have a great upcoming schedule. We have a number of topics that I mentioned before. We have the thousand years coming up. We have the great reset coming up. We have just some dynamic topics that are going to help encourage you and your walk with Jesus each day. You can also ask a Bible question online. There's a little tab there on the website. Just click that, submit your Bible question, and we will do our best to answer it either here or in an email response to you. There's also a donate button if you have an interest in sharing back with uh, the blessings that you have received. You're welcome to do that also. Now, just in our last meeting, some of you filled out a decision card online. And we have a number of local representatives all around your area. They may reach out to you about the decision that you've made. We want to encourage you that we trust them and that you can visit with them and see what your next steps are as you're walking more closely with Jesus. So friends, thank you again for joining us. At this time, I'm going to invite Pastor John Bradshaw to join me out here for some Bible questions that you have submitted. And we're very excited to welcome you, Pastor John. I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Wes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. It is a blessing to see you. I know you spoke about meeting uh, subjects coming up. Next time, charmed by the supernatural. So we'll talk about a lot of what's happening in the world with uh, spiritualism and the occult and so forth. Um, and, and whether you realize it or not, it's going to answer an enormous amount of questions on people's minds. Some of the most important hot button subjects in the world today. That's not an exaggeration at all. So that's next time you don't want to miss charmed by the supernatural. That's right. We have some Bible questions here tonight. Yes, Number sir. one is, how do I respond to a skeptic? who believes in God but doesn't accept the inner acts or influences our everyday lives. In other words, the perception is that God doesn't help or hinder what happens on planet Earth. When you ask the question, how do I respond to a skeptic, the answer is not very easy to find. Skeptics are skeptical for a reason, or they're skeptics for a reason. That's because they're skeptical. So they're not the most open to hearing a neat, nice, pithy response or explanation from you or anybody else. Something has helped them to arrive at their position. Now, what they believe, uh, according to the question, is, is in this instance, God doesn't have a whole lot to do with the everyday doings of this world. And then you have to ask yourself, why does somebody believe that? Probably an experience they've had, something on their mind, something they've been through, something they've witnessed. It's not unusual for somebody to see a great amount of suffering around them in the world and then arrive at the conclusion that if God was really a good God and a loving God, he wouldn't allow that kind of suffering. So it might be something like that. Don't feel like you can easily talk someone out of something. What you don't want to do is argue. You don't want to be belligerent. You don't want to be antagonistic. You just don't. So the first thing you want to do is give people a witness, an opportunity to see in your life that your beliefs matter, you living out your faith. Now, when you get the opportunity to interact with that person, you might ask questions, gently inquire as to why they feel that way. Ask them about their experience. See if there can be an interchange. If there can be, well, now God is leading you perhaps to help that person. 
But the one thing you don't want to do is come on like a bulldozer. Uh, there's, there's nothing good ever comes of that. Skeptics are skeptics. So tread carefully. Be uh, prayerful. Pray and ask God to help you answer that person aright. And remember, the battle is not yours, it's God's. He enters you into those situations so he can speak through you. Absolutely. Sharing your story is one of the very best things you can do. Absolutely. And if you took all the stories in the world, lined them up together, either it's the biggest coincidences in the history of humanity or there's a God in heaven. Amen. Has to be the second. Number two, regarding the Sabbath topic from last evening, if God commands us to keep the Sabbath still today, how would you explain Colossians 2, verses 14 to 17, that counsels believers not to let anyone judge you on keeping the Sabbath or the ordinances that were nailed to the cross? Uh Aha, very good. So Colossians chapter 2, that's where we'll go right now. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 14. So a specific passage has been referenced here. And I'm glad it has. Colossians chapter 2. Now, when you read a passage that you may have a little challenge understanding, look at the thing in its context. Be sure and do that. And sometimes you need to look at the overall context of the book itself. When Paul writes to the Colossians, he's dealing with people who've introduced odd ideas. And so he begins the book of Colossians by establishing that Jesus is enough If you read through Colossians starting in chapter 1 and and read on, you will see the the sufficiency of Jesus, Christ alone. The Savior is enough for whatever it is you're facing. Colossians 2 verse 3, speaking of Jesus, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And that's just a brief example. We have not time to look at all of them. Then he says in verse 8, Beware lest anyone spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He's building his case. Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is all. And then he makes, he applies the point. Careful, because there are some who are going to try and lead you astray with their traditions, you see. And then we read in verse, I think it's verse 9. Let me see here. For in him, that's in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. Then verse 11, he mentions circumcision, saying that you're circumcised in Christ. You don't need to be circumcised physically. Verse 13, buried with him in baptism. Verse That was 12. Verse 13, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made you alive and he's forgiven you of your sins. Verse 14, R- remember what it is? Is Jesus enough or not? And now he moves into this thing about traditions, and he starts to speak about the ceremonial law, talking about circumcision. Now he carries the idea on. He carries the idea on, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So something was nailed to the cross, and here you'll find some who say, well, that was the Ten Commandments. How you can nail thou shalt not kill to a cross, I don't know, but that's what people say. But Paul tells us what it is. It's the handwriting of ordinances that was nailed to the cross. Whatever it was, it was the handwriting of ordinances. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Then he says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Except he didn't follow that with a period. He followed that with a comma. The Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. Let's put some things together. Something was blotted out, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Could the Sabbath possibly have been blotted out? Well, it wasn't the handwriting of ordinances. That was the ceremonial law written by Moses. God wrote the Ten Commandments, didn't call them ordinances. So that's one thing. Notice the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come. 
Now, the weekly seven-day Sabbath was not a shadow of things to come, but the annual Sabbaths, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Trumpets, Pentecost, Day of Atonement, they were Sabbaths, and they were shadows of things to come. So what was blotted out was not the weekly Sabbath, but the ceremonial law, including the ceremonial annual Sabbaths, the feast days. Of course, it doesn't make any sense at all that God would blot out his Ten Commandments. We don't believe thou shalt have no other gods before me was blotted out. Let's just be consistent. The commandments are ten, ten in one, and God didn't blot out any of the Ten Commandments. So that there refers to the Sabbath days which were a shadow, and that very clearly, the annual Sabbaths, not the weekly Sabbath. Law of God, the law of Moses, law of Moses fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. Ten Commandments last forever. Number three, please reconcile what the Bible says about the day of the Lord coming as a thief and Revelation 16, 15, where Jesus says himself that he is coming as a thief. That's talking about the subject we had on the Great Reset, the second coming of Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's a great question, too. Thanks for asking that question, because I was pretty adamant that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, and you have rightly pointed out that here in this verse, Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. That's correct. That's exactly what it says. But this does not indicate that Jesus himself sneaks in, does his business, and sneaks out. Jesus comes as a thief in this context, in the context of Armageddon and the seven last plagues. Next verse, he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So, for the unsaved, Jesus will come suddenly, unexpectedly. For the saved at the end of time, we are waiting and watching for the return of Jesus, and it will come as no surprise, and we will not be caught out. So Jesus is saying there, watch, be ready, don't be overtaken by my return as a surprise because you have not been prepared for that day. He's saying, live in readiness for the return of Jesus. That's right. Matthew chapter 24 and 25 talk about that as well, the timing of Jesus' return. Number four, how do I keep the Sabbath holy as the Bible says? What activities are acceptable since I'm not working on that day? That's a really good question. It might take me a while to answer that, so I'll just take a, a little look at it now. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, well, wait, 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 before that, before we talk about what we cannot do, we're not even going to talk about what we cannot do what you want the question is what pleases god and god said in it thou shalt not do any work so so there's that it's not a work day but but i, I you know i said we, we talk about the possibilities and then i talked about that when jesus was on the earth the sabbath was a day for fellowship and worship it was a god day you simply left out all the secular stuff and focused on god instead it doesn't mean you have to sit in your bedroom and read the Bible from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Of course, it doesn't mean that. And if you are a Sabbath observer, then your understanding of it will grow in time. So you don't need to feel like you've got every last, you've studied every, you've asked every question. I mean, okay to study and learn, but you don't need to sweat this. I can't do this until I have every last little skerrick of information. That would not be appropriate. So you can imagine you want to spend time with God. Where do you do that? Well, at home, in church, in nature, with others. So it's not necessarily a day of solitude. I've been asked, do you have to fast on that day? Oh, no. Oh, no. Why would you, why would you do that? You don't need to do that. Now, if you really want to know what the Bible says clearly about what not to do, you don't want to work. You don't want to engage in the secular sort of thing. Um, another thing in the book of Nehemiah makes it clear that it's not a day for buying and selling. So let's start there. We leave off work, we leave off commerce, we leave off trading, we leave off buying, and we focus on God's presence and doing those things that bind our hearts with the heart of God. Amen. Sounds like a great idea to me. Amen. We'll save our last question for next meeting. We're out of time for this segment, okay. but uh, we'll jump into that on our next time for Bible Q&A. Thank you so much, Pastor John. At this time, friends, we just want to follow the Bible. Amen? Isn't that, isn't that a simple thing to do? What does the Bible say? Let's obey it. Let's seek to please God. He gave his life for us. What greater thing can we do than to give our hearts and lives back to him? Amen? 
At this time, we'll enjoy another special number by Claudia Treyer and Scott Michael Bennett entitled, Remember Me. Remember me In a Bible cracked and faded by the years Remember me In a sanctuary filled with silence
Wasn't that fantastic? Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being here. We're going to pray and dive right in and expect that God will speak to our hearts. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. It's a blessing to be in your presence. Or would make it an even greater blessing as if you were to speak to us clearly. We are living in vitally important days. We sense the sands of time are quickly running through the hourglass and there are not many more to pass through. So tonight as we come to you in Christ's name, we will open the word of God and, and pray that your spirit would lead us. We thank you for our time. Bind our hearts with yours. Uh, attract and gain and, and lock in our attention. And bless us, please, for your honor, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Whereas the provinces of Canada, uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick have expressed their desire to be federally united into one dominion under the crown of United Kingdom, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, with a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom, and whereas such a union would conduce to the welfare of the provinces and promote the interests of the British Empire, and so begins the preamble to Canada's Constitution Act of 1867. Canada's Constitution is supreme law in Canada. You won't be surprised about that. It outlines not only Canada's system of government, but also civil and human rights. Interestingly enough, the British do not have a written constitution. Instead, the United Kingdom has what is called or referred to as an uncodified constitution. But here in the United States, different. We're a little more like our neighbors to the north. About half a mile from the Delaware River, a quarter of a mile from Benjamin Franklin's final resting place, and really a stone's throw from the Liberty Bell, is Independence Hall, where both the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution were adopted and debated. The Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. Constitution was ratified in 1788 before becoming effective in 1789. And it begins like this. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. It is regarded as the oldest written and codified national constitution in existence in all the world. It has been described as a bold experiment in democracy. It has three main functions, the constitution creates a national government considering or rather consisting of a legislative and executive and a judicial branch with a system of checks and balances among the three branches. Second, it divides power between the federal government and the states. And thirdly, it protects various individual liberties for American citizens. Now, the Constitution of the United States has been amended how many times? 27 times. First time was in 1791 when this provision was added. You may be familiar with this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Same year, Second Amendment. Keep in mind, these two amendments and maybe others were written only two years after the Declaration of Independence was adopted and came into effect. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms 
shall not be infringed. That's one that gets talked about a lot today. What about the 16th Amendment? If we would have a quiz about amendments, how well would you do? 16th Amendment. Now, you are very familiar with it. It was adopted in the year 1913, and it says, The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived, without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. Uh, Probably not everybody's thrilled by that one. 1920, the 19th Amendment gave what? The right to which? Women the right to vote. That's right. The most recent amendment was adopted in 1991. It prevents members of Congress from granting themselves pay raises during whatever the the current session of Congress is. The idea was to prevent uh, Congress people from voting an increase to themselves and getting it If you push it out until the next time around, then uh, it might make things a little bit safer. You won't have Congress men and women voting themselves gigantic increases willy-nilly. At least that is the idea. Interestingly enough, the idea for that amendment was first floated in 1789. Took 202 years for the thing to get passed. And so we wonder this. How do you amend the Constitution? Well, the United States Senate says two ways. They say this. Amendments may be proposed either by the Congress through a joint resolution passed by a two-thirds vote or by a convention called by Congress in response to applications from two-thirds of the state legislatures. Amending the Constitution, even though it has already been amended 27 times, is not a simple matter. In fact, it's a very, very big deal because you would be fundamentally altering the supreme law of the United States of America. Imagine then amending the Constitution of heaven. How could you do that? Imagine making a change to the supreme law of heaven. Now, we do know that one division of God's law was totally abolished when Jesus died on the cross. Colossians 2 verse 14 says that when Jesus died on the cross, He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. But what we know is that the Bible there is referring to the ceremonial law. You might refer to it as the law of Moses. The types, the shadows, the feast days, the sacrifices gone because Jesus, the true and ultimate sacrifice, just gave his life out there on an old rugged cross. It would be pointless now to bring lambs and goats and turtle doves, just pointless. In fact, Bringing those sacrifices now would be a denial that Jesus himself was actually the Messiah. Because if you believe that, you would say the one sacrifice has been made. We don't need these little animal sacrifices anymore. They were important, but they had their time. An entire division of the law became obsolete. But what prompted that? I mean, stop and think about that. You had the Ten Commandments over here. You had the ceremonial law over here, the ceremonial law was going to be done away with, what would it take? What, a vote, a plebiscite, a a, a show of hands? What would it take for that to be done away with? Well, what it was, was the death of Jesus on the cross. A pretty big deal. I mean, the the most dramatic demonstration of anything that could ever have been given, I think. And when the ceremonial law was was done away with, and the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, it was marked by Jesus dying on the cross. Mark 15, 38 tells us what happens. It was a big, big deal. God altered his law once, not the Ten Commandments, but the ceremonial law. And when he did, he marked that with the death of Jesus. Extremely significant. And so now let's look at something together. But first, let's review. Let's take a look at the Ten Commandments. We'll run through them nice and quickly. The first one in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Second commandment says, Don't make any graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Exodus 20 and verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, 
honor your father and your mother. Verse 13, thou shalt not kill, which really means murder. Verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse 15, do not steal. Verse 16, do not lie. Don't bear false witness. And verse 17 of Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not covet. Now together, we've already reviewed these 10 principles. And we have already agreed together that they're very good. We can't find any fault in them. We don't look at the one about stealing and say, that's not a good one. We didn't look at the one about honoring your parents or, or not committing adultery or not bowing down to graven images. We can find absolutely no fault with any of those. They're all good. They're solid. They're okay. And so therefore, we might be concerned that the Bible speaks about the rise of someone called the man of sin. In other places, you'll see that expressed as the man of lawlessness, same thing. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 begins, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come except there be a falling away first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Interesting that man of sin is going to arise. Notice he's not referred to as the man of violence, the man of division, the man of discourtesy. He's not referred to as the man of rudeness, the man of skill, or the man of wisdom, man of sin. And that ought to speak to you, tell you something there. So when you get down to the book of Revelation, this, this battle, this conflict, this controversy between right and wrong, good and evil, Christ and Satan, you see it coming to a head. People, the world, moving more and more away from faithfulness to God, that speaks to the day we're in. Look, we look around our world and some people are alarmed that there's no prayer in schools. Okay, put, put that into our, into our basket here. And then people are alarmed about evolution being taught in schools and universities. Add that as well. And the rise of immorality and the wholesale acceptance of pornography and incivility and nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom and diseases and epidemics and pandemics. You thought swine flu was bad. Mad cow disease was bad. Now we got something that you can barely hide from and people are dying left and right. It speaks to us about sin coming to its fruition down in the close of time. And so ultimately, this issue between good and evil will be resolved. And what God will do is that he will grant the wish of the saved to be saved. He'll let them have their way. And God will honor the wishes of the unsaved to be left alone to do their own thing. He will grant their desires. So let's go back over some of this ground. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. That's you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your female servant, or your cattle, or your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And you wonder why he did. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day of creation, everything was pretty good. God said very good after he made Adam, well, actually after he made Eve. And then, and he wasn't done. He said, I'm giving you the Sabbath. I'm carving it out of the rock of time. You need this. Why, God? Why? Because he knew that we needed time out from the busyness of life. He knew that. He knew that people would need time to connect with each other. He knew that people needed time to connect with God. God gave the Sabbath as a memorial, a memorial of creation and of recreation. This is why he gave it. And what a great idea. God gave the human family the seventh-day Sabbath to keep forever in mind that he is creator and recreator. And so we shouldn't at all be surprised that the one sign of God's great creative power of ownership of the world should be attacked, that it should be minimized, even tr trampled on. And what a blessing that God gave this day. What a blessing. Now, keep something in mind. It was never intended to be solely for the Jews. The Jews were late to the party. 
The Sabbath was given at creation. Jews didn't come along for another 2,300 years. So they got to the Sabbath late. It's not for Jews. It's for everyone. Uh, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, meaning humanity. Imagine God's people wandering in the wilderness, settled in the promised land. They kept, they, they looked forward to the Sabbath. They did. It was a day out. It was a day of oneness with God. It was a day of worship. It was a day to remember that there was a God on the throne in heaven and that he was great and mighty. When Jesus was on the earth, he and his disciples looked forward to the Sabbath. It was a day of rest. Imagine that society, an agrarian society. They grew their food and they farmed their animals and they worked with their hands. Life was busy, you know. They didn't turn the tap on with water coming out. They didn't go to the store just up the street and buy loaves of bread. As a rule, this was the sort of thing they did in their home from scratch. There were no microwave meals. And so the Sabbath was, oh, what a day. And not just because it was a day away from regular labor and work, but it was all about their faith in God and a celebration that they were God's children. Today, more than ever, we see the importance of rest, of coming aside, of stepping back, the importance of making in your life room for what really matters. God knew what he was doing when he, was, when he gave the human family this important gift. This is a God who loves communion with his children. He loves fellowship. I mean, it's clear God craves, and I use that word deliberately, he craves spending time with us. Think about that. What does that tell you about God's character and about his love for the human family? God has a universe so vast, you cannot comprehend its size. There are billions and billions of galaxies in the universe. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, it would take you 100,000 years to get across it if you traveled at the speed of light. 186,000 miles a second. Imagine how vast this universe is, and yet God delights to spend time with you. Are you that special? Oh, yes, you are. You've heard somebody say to you once, oh, don't think you're so special. Uh, okay, but no, you are that special and more. God looks forward to that day with you. So if Jesus or the disciples or the early Christian church were to change the Sabbath, that would be monumental, colossal. 2,000 years after Jesus' death, that's where we are today, you and I both know that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment has largely been changed by Christians who've adopted Sunday and by secular people who regard Sunday as not different, not special, not holy, not due any sort of reverence. This has become a secular day, uh, a work day, maybe a family day. Many people are looking at this as a family day. I want you to think about something. In Bible times, Jesus' disciples were walking through the fields. They were hungry. They, they plucked some ears of grain from the corner of the field where they were allowed to do that. In order to get to the grain, they rubbed the grain in their hand to, to thresh it, as it were. And they were accused of working on the Sabbath. Now, of course, that wasn't work. But that accusation goes to show how zealously the hyper-religious but not hyper-converted Jews uh, re related to the Sabbath. Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. Take up your bed and walk. He picked up whatever it was he had, maybe a roll of some kind or a blanket. They said, you can't do that. That's work. Of course, it wasn't work. The point that I'm making, however, is they were really careful about the Sabbath. So careful about it. I mean, inappropriately, inaccurately careful in those instances, that when Jesus and his disciples did something they didn't like the smell of, they wanted to kill them. Kill them, can you imagine? So imagine all of a sudden, a sect rising up right after the death of Jesus, and there in the heart of Jerusalem, instead of remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy, they were busy ignoring that and going to church on another day. Can you imagine that that would have gone sliding by with ease in Jerusalem? 
You think Israel would have been sure, you go ahead, you do that, come on. In that environment, there would have been a civil war. There would have been widespread persecution. There would have been bloodshed. So if God's law was going to change, if there was going to be an amendment to the constitution of heaven regarding the Ten Commandments, God would give explicit instructions about that. No question. Remember, when the ceremonial law was no longer to be kept, Jesus died. That was a pretty big sign that something had changed. God says to us today, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What do we say about that? It's very clear. It's in the Bible. It's not ambiguous. But the reality is not everybody is enthusiastic about it. And it's puzzling that Christians lead the charge in denouncing the seventh-day Sabbath, or ignoring, or countering, or, or debating. It might be that even where you worship, there are people who will tell you, oh, that's crazy, or that's not necessary, or that's legalism, or there's something wrong with that, even though if you go to the Bible, you find it right there. As a matter of fact, if you found a non-Christian who'd never heard of the Bible and said, what day is the Christian day of worship? They would say, haven't got a clue. So you'd put the Bible in their hand and you would say, start reading at the beginning and when you find the holy day, tell me. And they would get to the second chapter of the Bible and say, Eureka, I have found it. It would take them five minutes. A non-Christian, five minutes, if that. It's there in the Bible. Now, today, of course, most people don't think of the Sabbath, but instead they think of Sunday as a day of rest. But is Sunday a holy day? Is it in the Bible? Did God ever say, don't do that, instead do this? Here is my will for you. If you love me, I want you to do this. We'll meet on a different day now. The truth is, the fact is, God never ever said that. And I would maintain, and I think it would be fair if I did, that if Sunday worship, Sunday observance is actually in the Bible, then the Bible would have to say so. Surely it would. But in the New Testament, Sunday is hardly mentioned. You barely find mention of it. The Sabbath, many, many, many times all throughout the Bible, even in the New Testament, but not Sunday. Now, you do find some mentions I think you find the first day of the week mentioned eight times. Five times it just says it happened to be the first day. No big deal. Three times we go into some detail. So let's look at that. John chapter 20 verse 19 is one of those instances. The Bible says, so when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, you got it? It was the first day of the week, Sunday in the evening. When the doors were shut where the disciples were, for what reason? Can you tell me? For fear of the Jews, so they weren't there worshiping. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. Okay, that's referring to Sunday. What were they doing? They were preserving their lives. They were hiding. They were scared. They just killed Jesus. We're worried they're going to get us next. So clearly, this reference to Sunday has got nothing to do with Sunday being the Sabbath, and that's important. Now, writing to the Corinthians, Paul spoke to this very thing. I want you to see this. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we're starting in verse 1. Paul wrote, now concerning the collection for the saints... As I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. He said, on the first day of the week, that Sunday, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Okay, Sunday, put money aside on Sunday. And people have said, oh, that's talking about an offering in church. Okay, I can understand. You, you can see where somebody gets that from. You can see that. But that's not what it says. The background was this. There was a famine. God's people in Jerusalem were, were, were struggling. Paul said, we're going to help them. I want you to give some money to help the struggling saints down there in Jerusalem. So what we're going to do is I'm going to send somebody up there to collect money. In the interim, every first day of the week, put some money aside. Put some money aside on the Sunday. They didn't call it Sunday. On the first day of the week. You keep doing that. 
And when I get somebody to go down there, they can just go to you, and, and you've already got it collected. They can just gather it up and bring it back. That's all this is. No mention at all about a worship service, certainly nothing about an offering in church. Important we notice that. Now, when Paul was in Corinth, what did he do? It tells us in Acts chapter 18. This is clear. It's really instructive. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to where? Tell me. Corinth, that's, we just read his letter to the Corinthians, verse 4 says, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and who? Greeks. So it wasn't just for Jews, it was Jews and Greeks in the synagogue on the Sabbath when Paul was in Corinth, he was observing the seventh-day Sabbath. Nothing had changed, and it's important that we understand that. Now, in Acts chapter 20 is really the third and, and final time you see the first day of the week actually mentioned or discussed in any meaningful way in the New Testament. Now, this is really interesting. We're going to read this. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued the message until when? Midnight. That's right. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. The moral of the story is very clear. Don't fall asleep in church. That's what that is. Now, you might say the moral is clear. Don't preach till midnight. So, okay, we'll, 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 we'll press on. So what happened here? Paul preached. Eutychus fell out of church. He healed the brother. And then if you continue reading in this, the Bible will tell you that on the very next day, Paul walked 14 miles or so to a town named Assos. Now, here's the background. Or, or, or let, let's interpret this a little bit. A day is represented in the Bible from sunset to sunset. This was the first day of the week. That would be Sunday, but it was dark. So this had to have been Saturday night. You understand what I'm saying? Seventh day begins Friday at sunset and ends Saturday at sunset. The first day begins Saturday at sunset, ends Sunday at sunset. So if it was dark on the first day of the week, that had to be Saturday night. So Saturday night, they were together. Paul preached. Eutychus had his issues. Paul raised him back from the dead. He got some sleep, and the next day he walked miles and miles on Sunday to meet up with the ship in another place so they could travel together. That passage demonstrates not that Sunday is the Sabbath, but clearly that Sunday is not a holy day. Because on Sunday, instead of being in church and worshiping and breaking bread or doing whatever it was they did, Paul went for a very, very long hike, treating Sunday like any other secular day. So this passage doesn't show Sunday sacredness. It demonstrates the exact opposite. We don't want to miss something here, and that is that the commandments of God point us to Jesus Christ. God says, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is the path of safety. God's law is like a hedge of protection, but like a fence that, that, that keeps you in here and, and, and prevents you from getting far away from God if you're following the footsteps of Jesus. Sabbath was created in the beginning as a blessing, a day off, public holiday, God says. Here, have this. In the final days of Earth's history, God alerts the world. This becomes an issue. Worship. And he calls to the world to worship him. Final gospel message to go to the world. Revelation 14, 7. Worship him who made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. A call to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The angel of Revelation 14 uses the same language that you find in the fourth commandment back in Exodus 20. You compare the two. Find what you read in Exodus 20 and compare it to Revelation chapter 14. Same phraseology. John simply borrowed those words from Exodus to impress upon us that what God was calling us to do was worship him in spirit and in truth. It's really clear. 
God is calling us back to remember something that has long been forgotten by so many people. Jesus gave us an example. Luke 4, verse 16, as his custom was, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus tells New Covenant, New Testament Christians, Matthew chapter 24, pray that your flight is not on the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Answer me that. The year 70 AD, why would it matter if your flight was on the Sabbath day? Because you would be remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 40 years after the death of Jesus, the disciples couldn't have changed the law of God. For one, they had no right to do so. But you notice in Acts 5 and verse 29, they say, we ought to obey God rather than men. And if the Ten Commandments are in heaven and you want to have them changed, then you would have to send somebody from earth to heaven, march into the city of God, march into the heavenly temple, walk right into the most holy place, push your way past two angels, push God off the throne, get rid of the mercy seat, and then go to work amending the Ten Commandments of Almighty God. A far-fetched scenario? Oh, yes, it is. It's just not possible. It could never happen. Imagine Jesus dying on the cross and saying to you, this is important to me. I died for you. If Jesus said this is important to him, wouldn't it be important to you? Yes, it would. There's no question about it. We want to identify with the Savior. To identify with the Savior doesn't mean, oh, Jesus died for me, all is good. No, wait a minute. Discipleship is about following Jesus, honoring Jesus, allowing God into your life both to will and to do for his good pleasure. The Christian says, I'm grateful for the cross, so grateful that Christian then turns to Jesus and says, whatever your will is, that's what I want done in my life. I'd like you to consider something with me. It's something you know. And that is that human beings possess a remarkable uh, capacity for seeing things as they really are not. Take a look at these two lines and tell me quickly which one is the longest. Well, you know, right, that the vertical line looks longer, but it's not longer than the horizontal line. Looks like it is, but it, you can look at that all day long, and the line running up and down looks like it's longer than the line running from side to side. Take a look at this. You already know the answer, but, but which line, which horizontal line is longer? Can you tell me? Exactly the same length. They're exactly the same length. Now, why does that happen? Well, you, you, your brain is like a supercomputer, but your brain cannot see. What your brain does is it takes cues from your eyes. Eyes will say, this, this is what we see, and the brain says, well, I will interpret that. That's why you look at something like this, and you see some funny things going on. Especially if you get close to it, you look at that and it appears like those lines are moving. You look over here, it's moving over there. Look over there, it's moving over here. Your brain takes the limited information that it gets via the optic nerve and then it fills in the blanks, fills in the gaps. It makes guesses, your brain does, based on the limited information that it has. Ordinarily, those guesses are really pretty good, but sometimes not so good. Sometimes some strange things happen as a result. You see things that aren't moving, See things that are moving. You ever, you ever hear this? You, ever, you hear about the, the, the Yanni and Laurel thing? Did you ever hear? Take a listen to this and tell me what you hear. Listen. Laurel. 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 What do you hear, Yanni or Laurel? Who, who hears Yanni? Can you raise your hand? Oh, yeah, that's a few. Who hears Laurel? Who's right? Let's listen again. Tell me what you hear. Did it change or did you hear the same as what you heard before? Same, right? First time around, I heard both. That's the only time I've ever heard both. Second time around, I heard the right one, Laurel. Yeah. You people are hearing Yanny. I got, I got no idea. Listen again. Let's listen again. Laurel. Laurel. Laurel.
Now that's Laurel. So, so someone is hearing Yanny and you're convinced that that's what it says? We have to do something about your ears. <laughs> Earwax. But that's what the brain does, right? You hear something and your brain says, I got to make a snap judgment on that. And in this case, it's because of high frequencies and low frequencies and you're hearing one and not the other. Or on rare occasions, you might hear a little bit of both. That's, that's that we do that. It's like the dress on the internet. I don't know if you remember seeing that dress. Some said it was blue and black. Others said it was white and gold. I didn't have a clue one way or the other, actually. So your brain takes the information that you have and then processes it. And sometimes you can see things that you don't see and hear things that you might not hear. Take a look at this with me. A little brain teaser for you. I want you to think. A bat and ball cost together a dollar and ten cents. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Don't be shy. How much? Ten cents. Do we agree? Pretty obvious, isn't it? Who thinks differently? How much? Yeah, there's always somebody. <laughs> we'll come back to you. So we're convinced, aren't we? Uh, 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 irrespective of what the what they say how much does the ball cost 10 cents it's pretty obvious the bat and the ball they cost a dollar and 10 so the ball costs how much 10 cents now keep in mind the bat costs more a dollar more than the ball so if you say 10 cents then the bat costs a dollar and 10 cents and now you got a dollar 20 see what i'm saying don't you the bat and the ball together cost a dollar 10 if the, ball, if, if the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, and you have the ball at 10 cents, the bat then costs a dollar 10, you've spent a dollar 20, you are what we call in the business, wrong. So how much does the ball cost? Costs five cents. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. That would make the bat costing a dollar and five cents. Five, and a dollar five equals, tell me please, a dollar and ten cents. I know. I can wait. I can wait. I know somebody's looking at that. No, wait a minute. What? A dollar ten, ten cents. It's a dollar, right? Nope. Five cents and a dollar and five cents. I looked at that the first time. I shook my head. It told me I was wrong. I said, how can I be wrong? It's very obvious, isn't it? Everyone I've shared this with, everyone, oh, with the exception of two people now, have said the ball was 10 cents and the wrong. The brain works that way. We leap to conclusions. We make certain assumptions. They seem right at the time. Sure they do. So we're able to look at something clearly with all the, we had all the information that we needed and we failed to perceive it for what it really is. Now, when it comes to Sunday, we understand that people for hundreds and hundreds of years have accepted a change in the law of God. Just accept it. Like it should have been that way. Now, you have all the information. The law of God. The Bible says the law of God is holy. And we just kind of roll with it. And we say a change in the law of God. Well, sure. Hold on a minute. How does that happen? Jesus said, I did not come to, to, to destroy the law or the prophets, and we accept the destruction of the law. Why is that? You see, what has happened is this. Most people simply haven't stepped back and looked at it and analyzed it and weighed the situation up for what it really is. Changing the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week would be amending the constitution of heaven. It would be the, the first amendment to heaven's law. And fascinatingly, not the only amendment. We'll tell you more later. People have changed the law of almighty God. So how'd that come about? If the Bible doesn't sanction the change, who made the change? Well, it happened gradually. In the fourth century, the emperor of the Roman Empire was a fellow named Constantine. His empire was fractured, 
And as part of an effort to unite his empire, he sought to unite it religiously. Constantine had had a, a sort of a conversion to Christianity, a nominal conversion at best. And so he said, we're all going to be Christians in my empire. But as a concession to the pagans, he announced that the worship day would be the venerable day of the sun. Everybody would be a Christian, worship the Christian God, but on the pagan Sunday. Look at this. A decree of Constantine from the year 321 AD. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let their shops be closed. The commandments of God were changed by the government of the Roman Empire making an effort to unite its fractured kingdom, to unite pagans and Christians in one empire. It wasn't changed by Jesus. It wasn't changed by the disciples. It, it simply wasn't. This was a gradual change that took place. And then it entered into, it just gently entered into the practice of the church of the day. Eventually, the modern church would claim the credit for making the change. You can find this in a church teaching book, in a, in a catechism. It'll, it, question and answer just says this, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Here's the answer, because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Just like that, the church says, this is why. Now, does any church have the authority to change God's law? Can you tell me the answer? The answer is no. Of course the answer is no. But down through the years, due to the influence of tradition, the practice has become entrenched in the Christian church. This is not a secret. From a book called Catholicism and Fundamentalism, written by Carl Keating, you read this on page 38. It's interesting. Fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday. Yet there's no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath or day of rest was, of course, Saturday. Isn't that something? It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. That's absolutely true. Now, the Catholic Church has no right to do that, and I don't say that to be critical. I'm just pointing out the facts. No one has the right to change the commandments of God, but that church did and actually claims it really rather proudly. One cardinal said this, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday that was written by a fellow named Cardinal James Gibbon. That's where Sunday comes from, not from the Bible, slipped into Christianity through the back door from tradition. Now, are all traditions bad things? Absolutely not. Thanksgiving in the United States, that's a great tradition. Thanksgiving in Canada, that's a tremendous tradition. But when a tradition usurps one of the commandments of God, it is no longer a good tradition. It's not difficult to see the problems here. Question I have for you is who made you? The answer would be God or Jesus. Who suffered and died for you? That would be Jesus. Who rose from the dead for you and me? Jesus. Who has redeemed us? Jesus. When you trust him, yield your life to him, you're not saying, how do I just slide on by here? You're saying, what's your will? Let me do that. I remember sitting my 10th grade exams. In order to get into the 11th grade, you had to pass an exam where, where, when I was going to high school. Now, thank the Lord, the passing grade was 50%. And some of us were celebrating. It wasn't a matter of getting 80s and 90s, high 90s, or even 100. It was a matter of just sliding by. And by some miracle of grace, I managed to squeak by out of the 10th grade and into the 11th. That worked in school. I mean, to some degree, children don't try this at home. But in faith, you don't do that. You don't try to slide by. You don't attach yourself to some religious faith, community, church, tradition, idea, and say, good enough for me. Following the God who made you, redeemed you, the Jesus who's coming back for you, that's when you say, what's truly your will? I want to do your will. I want to honor you with my life. That's what we pray to God. There should be nothing we would not surrender to the God of heaven. 
Ask yourself about the foundation of your faith. Is your faith resting on what God says or on what human beings say? Sometimes it isn't easy to see the clarity of a certain subject. Maybe because of history. Well, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. Maybe because of what others are doing. Well, my parents did it this way. Or my family, my neighbors, all the people that I hang with, that's how they operate their lives. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that we are saved by grace through what? Through faith. What's faith? Faith is relying on the word of God to do what it says it will do. Simply because it it says it will do so. Faith. Relying on the word of God to do what it says it will do for the simple fact that it says so. God's word. That's faith. Remember what Jesus said. If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. That's really clear. The person who is moved by love for God is going to want to live for the one who died for that person. We see the importance of of faith. You know, I I know she's no biblical authority, but I like the quote from Dr. Joyce Brothers, the, the, the once noted psychologist or pop psychologist, perhaps. She said, the best proof of trust is what she say, love. I know she's not a biblical authority, but I think it's a very good quote. The best proof of love is trust. Abraham loved God. How do you know? How do you know he did? Because when God said, take now your son, your only son, whom thou lovest, and offer him for a sacrifice, Abraham said, okay, I'll do it. It was pretty clear Isaac loved God because when he understood what his father Abraham was doing, Isaac said, all right, dad, go ahead. If it would be me, I'd have pushed the old man aside and run for my life. But faith brings trust, and trust enables you to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. How about Noah? Noah, it's going to rain. What's that? There's going to be a flood. Huh? Build a boat. Okay. I don't know how many years people ridiculed Noah, probably all 120 years he built the ark. Why did he do it? Because he trusted God. And his trust was demonstrated in following the word of God. Gideon, get up an army. I'm good to go. Those Midianites are going to get us, it looks like, because they've got many more than we have, but we do have 32,000. And God said, too many. And when he whittled the army down to 300, God said, go. And Gideon said, okay. Why did he do that? Because he trusted God. He had faith in God. That trust was demonstrated in the way he lived his life. You'd have thought that was a suicide mission, except he was following God in faith, and God brought him out victorious. So let's see if we can follow God's leading. Noah was not sidetracked by the crowd. There was a vocal crowd, no doubt about it, but Noah stayed to his task, built the ark, and when the rain came down, one would imagine the others beating on the side of the ark saying, okay, Noah, we were wrong. Sorry about that. But they were on the outside rather than being on the inside. We don't even want to look at what our family members are doing, looking back and saying, oh, how about mom and dad and my brother and my sister? What are the kids doing? What are, what, what are the, the in-laws or the outlaws doing? You don't want to do that. You want to say, what does the Bible say? What is the will of God for my life? What does love for God look like in this situation? The Bible says in Revelation 14 and verse 12, here is the patience of the saved, the saints. Here are they that, you tell me, keep the commandments of God and the what? You see, you can't separate the two. Faith in Jesus leads you to obeying him, keeping the commandments of God. Not because you're trying to work your way to heaven. Not because you're not saved by grace through faith. Faith and keeping the commandments of God go hand in glove. Someone's going to tell you, oh, you can can just choose whatever day you want. Just like when it comes to the seventh commandment about adultery, you can choose whatever partner you want. When it comes to the commandment about idolatry, you could choose whatever idol you want. When it comes to the one about murder, you could choose whoever you want to murder. Absolutely not. When it comes to the fourth commandment, you say, all right, Lord, let's do your will. That attitude is a lot like what happened in the Garden of Eden. God said, don't eat that. Eat all of that, just not that. And Eve said, you know what I do? I'll eat that. And today when we say, I see what the Bible says about the seventh commandment, but 
I think I'll go do my own thing. We are simply reenacting the example given us by Eve in the Garden of Eden. Back in 1816, the very northern part of the United States, right at the tippy top of Lake Champlain, just 30 miles south of Montreal in Quebec, Canada, the United States did a very sensible thing and constructed a very large, strong stone fortification to defend this nation from Canada. Now, today, that seems strange, doesn't it? The United States and Canada, close friends, close allies, sure. But back then, this was British Canada that we were dealing with. And it was only, what, 40 years after the Declaration of Independence had been signed. It was just 30 years and some change after the Revolutionary War had ended. You couldn't trust those Brits, you know. Build a fortification. If they try to cross in here, we'll blow them away. So they built a fort right there near the Canadian border. It was built with good reason, and it was built in sincerity. Very sensible thing that they did. However, a year or two after construction began, a fascinating discovery was made. The United States government had actually built the fort to defend it against Canada in Canada built it on the wrong side of the border. And they had to say, oh, our bad, sorry about that. And back up a mile or so, maybe two miles, and start again. You find the completed fort, which name I should remember right there, but over there is the one that they refer to sometimes today as as Fort Blunder. It was never given a real title because of course it was never finished. Fort Blunder, what a blunder it was. They got it wrong. But when they did and realized it, they corrected things, didn't they? They built a new fort, and that new fort must have worked pretty well because Canada never did invade. Surely it was effective. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming back soon. In his mercy, he gives us the opportunity to recognize where we want to recalibrate our lives. No shame in doing so. The right thing to do is to say, Lord Jesus, I will follow you. I surrender my heart to you. I want your will to be done in my life. If you done built the fort on the wrong side of the border, it's all right. It's not too late. You can just back up here and build it right where it's supposed to be. One day, Jesus is going to come back. We have the privilege in this world of living for him, standing for him, honoring him, representing him. We have that granted us as a privilege today. And I wonder if I could appeal to your heart tonight. I wonder if I could speak to you and ask you if you'd be willing to say to God, tonight, I'm surrendering my heart to you. I'm surrendering my life to you. I want to ask the ushers tonight if they would do something for me. They ought to be ready about now to grab some cards. And if you're sitting at the edge of a row, put a little bundle of those cards in your hand. Please keep one and pass the rest along. Ushers, could you do that with some with some haste right now. I wonder if you'd do that for me. I'd appreciate it greatly. And while they're doing that, I want to read to you what my card says tonight. You'll notice it says, Revelation today, the great reset. And then, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's John 14 and verse 15. And as you're learning about this, there's a recognition dawning upon you. There's a realization coming to you. There's an awakening in your mind, and something back there is saying, Lord, I want to follow Jesus. That's my desire. You might be a lifelong believer in Jesus. This might be all new for you. But you know he died for you. Then he says, just as he said to the fisherman, follow me. Tonight he says, follow me. Let me read this with you. Number one of the five points says, I choose Jesus to be my Lord and personal Savior. Something wonderful happened out on an old rugged cross one day. Imagine the Son of God giving his life for you. Imagine that. Somebody investing in you to that extent. When human beings went off the rails, Jesus said, I'll go. He saw the depths of our wickedness. He said, I will go. I will take their sins upon me so they can go free. If you've never gone free, If you've never said in your heart, that's an especially good offer. 
If you've never come to the place where you've said, God, just take my heart, make it yours. Please check number one right there. I choose Jesus to be my Lord and personal Savior. Number two, I want to live my life according to God's will. Whatever that means to you where you are right now, or better said, whatever that means to God, are you willing to say, I want to live my life God's way? God's will be done. Number three, I choose to worship him that made heaven and earth by keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Now, you may have all of your questions answered. You may not. You may simply have met with the reality that this is the will of God for you. And therefore, it's your will to say, God, lead me that way. Check number three if that's your desire. Number four, I'd like more information on this subject. If you'd like that, let us know. We'll make sure you get that. Number five, I have some questions I'd like to discuss, and you'll fill that out with your details so we can pray for you by name and answer questions if you have them. If you don't have a card in your hand, I would like you to send me a text message. Send it to me right now. On my phone here, I'm going to text you right back. The number to reach me on is 71392. 71392. Send me the word truth, T-R-U-T-H. Text that word to 71392, and right away we'll send you a link right back, and you'll have what's written on this card right before you, and you can fill out that card on your device, on your computer, wherever you are right now. Hope you'll do that. Text TRUTH to 71392. There are five points as Scott sings, the God of heaven will speak to your heart, and I'm praying tonight that you would make a very real, prayerful, personal decision for Jesus. Near us till near Lord, to be so glad you've been here and made a decision for Jesus and we have that and God has marked that most importantly let me pray for you now our father in heaven we are grateful tonight there is a good God in heaven we know his name there's a great savior who knows our name and there is a heaven awaiting mansions there which may have our names right there on the door plate oh Lord we got to exist in this old sinful world and that's all right for we know the best is yet to come so keep us close to you guide and guard every decision for you that was made. And if somebody sort of hesitated on the banks of the Jordan tonight, I'm thankful that your spirit is not going to give up on that person, but please continue to plead and woo and draw and guide. We thank you for blessing us tonight. As we go, go with us, please. We pray and thank you. In Jesus' name, let everybody say together, amen and amen.